Well, today uh, we're here to begin a conversation with the goal of helping women gain the knowledge to support themselves in training, as well as build confidence in a mountain environment. We've collected feedback from many women and found a few common themes, including many concerns and frustrations. So we'd like to begin to address some of those topics today. Our first topic or a topic would be this concept of feeling a need to prove yourself. And that seems to be a frustration many women feel of needing to prove themselves when in a mountain environment uh, or when training for competitive events where women are often the minority. And then additionally feeling a lack of support due to that minority position. And that's a real frustration. Uh, we three uh, likely all have stories where we can relate to that topic and how we've handled those situations personally and professionally. And I'd love to turn the floor over to Maya and Allison and we'll start a conversation and share some of that. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I think we've, we've probably all experienced it ourselves and also have athletes we coach um, with, the, with the similar frustration. Um, the thing I think about the most is in either skiing or climbing or bigger mountain runs or anything where it can kind of just be assumed that the male is the leader or that the male knows the information of where you're going. And I, I catch it a lot on the trail if you run into another party and then they'll just talk to the male, um, which can be really, <laughs> really frustrating. Um, and so... I don't, what have your, what have your experiences been? I would say my biggest experience has been um, after high school, I took a year off to ski professionally and I was the only female on a team with five other guys ranging from 18 to 30 um, and constantly just like being way behind them training and getting like comments like, oh, you're so slow, you know, you should try to keep up. And these are like 30 year old, very fit Olympic athletes. Um, and just feeling that, like, I mean, I was working as hard as I could, but just feeling let down or like I wasn't good enough. Um, and in that atmosphere, it can just be unmotivating. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And Allison, I've had similar experiences that the role that uh, there's this a bit of this societal consciousness issue where when there's a man and a woman, the man will always get ask the question. Um, as you can imagine, being a certified guide and having started guiding multiple decades ago, um, you know, I was the minority. I mean, I multi, uh, most of the time was the only woman on a trip, uh, often the lead guide, guiding men. And if I was with a younger male guide, then Additionally, same kind of thing. People would ask the man uh, the questions and details. And, and I found that to be frustrating. So I remember specifically a trip when I was in Bolivia where a friend, and I want to emphasize that some of my greatest supporters um, and cheerleaders are my male counterparts. So it's not by any stretch, you know, all men. And they're up against some societal conditioning, which is changing slowly, but changing due to the fact that women like you two, myself and others exist and are starting to set the bar and support others um, and asking them to change their language. He says, you know, how, you know how capable you are and you know you're able and you have the depth of knowledge and the experience, do your best to ignore him, because he's a putz, I'm just using nicer language, and do what it is you know how to do and do it well, and you know, you will you will shine and he will shut up. And that has stayed with me for decades. Um, so that's something I think the three of us probably all have experience with, that we we have tape recorders and language in our heads to be like, no, no, no. And I don't want to be angry and frustrated internally. That doesn't help me. Um, and it doesn't change that person. Anyway. Totally. Yeah, I think about how 
how many times I've been in that in a similar scenario and often it's with um also a male friend like they're not wanting that scenario necessarily um and often if I point it out they're like whoa that is kind of wild and they don't even recognize that that was really in you know even that it really happened but more that um sometimes if if someone will then make a comment of like oh wow you're already up here or something then that that nobody would have said anything had it just been the male and that can be frustrating as well but i think you're right to to think about just doing your thing that's kind of the tape recorder that is in my head of like just keep doing what you're doing it doesn't matter whether it's a race or you know any comment i just try to turn around like well somehow that person is probably trying to make a compliment <laughs> um, and just keep doing what you're doing. Um, but it can be, it can be hard to, to turn that, to turn that around when it's, when it's in the moment. I think I need your guys' advice and voices in my head more because I, especially being a coach, being young and um, working with a lot of men specifically, just feeling like I need to prove myself for usually the first eight weeks. And then as soon as like they start seeing results, the conversation, the respect completely changes. Um, but it can be hard because I feel like that imposter syndrome or just feeling like I'm not quite good enough at my job. And then, you know, I'm a good coach. I do know that. And then as they realize it, it completely changes. So Allison and Carolyn, I need your guys. This is good advice for me, even at this stage in my life to hear that. <laughs> I think at any age, it's good. <laughs> the proving ourselves piece of this, yeah, that I feel is a really, so people hear about the power of positive thinking, but that goes one step further in the power of language that's used. So I feel rich and we need to be aware of that. We also need to be aware of the language that we use. There's one place where I really focus with the women that I coach, young and old, is the I'm sorry syndrome. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna try to erase that from the recorder. I tell my women inside, outside. If I'm inside my gym, if you drop a 45 pound weight on my toe, you can say you're sorry. <laughs> but just because you couldn't do a rep or you couldn't lift that weight or you fell on that climb, you know, there's no, absolutely no need to apologize for what you perceive as a lack of performance or that you thought you let me down because this isn't about me and there's nothing to apologize for. And if we can start changing that language, I think that's part of that deep proving that it just doesn't have to be there. You as a woman training for whatever you're training for, you are in process. You will get there one day and one step at a time. We don't need to apologize for where we're at. Yeah, I think that's so important. And I noticed that with a lot of newer people to training where um, they want to please me or they want to just do what I think what they think is expected. And so often I'm like, no, this is like, whatever you do is what you can do. And whatever you can do is great. That's how, that's how you get to where you want to go. Um, and then as you build, you know, you do little bits, you build that confidence. And then over time, you don't care that somebody might say something on the trail because you know that you have put in the work and you're doing everything that anybody else is doing or maybe more um and it's really cool from a coaching standpoint to see that shift happen too i think just working with female athletes in general there's always a big transition and the um, i mean this is a little off topic but just all my female athletes are always trying to do so much more <laughs> and beyond even what i lay out and I, it's it's inspiring i'm like no you guys need rest days or you need recovery weeks but just the strength I've seen in my athletes personally to just keep going with, you know, kids or travel or whatever. There's just a different toughness that I think women possess that sometimes we just don't recognize. Yeah. It's wild to me. When I first moved to the Valley, I was known around as the ultra runner. There's that girl that runs all the time. <laughs> and 
I would talk to people and be like, well, you could do it too. And it's like, oh, I could never run that far. I'm like, well, you don't just decide one day that you're going to run 50 miles. Like you build up to it. I never thought I would either. And, and then, it, and then I had a kid and there, then I would see some of the same people who said like, oh, I could never do that. And I was like, you've had three kids, like you can do anything. And that goes for any, you know, we all have a ton of stuff in our lives that we're balancing. And so, you know, whether you own a business or whether you work a job that's 50 hours a week or you stay at home with kids or like anything, like life has a ton of stuff in it. And so anything you decide to do, you can do with little bits um, of work and, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's really fun to see people then take that and, and run with it and realize that they can do something or, or realize that they have been working toward the things that they already are doing. Like they don't think about their 50 hour a week job as being something that they're accomplishing. But to a lot of people, like to me, I can't imagine doing that. <laughs> That's incredible that people spend that much time working toward one thing for work. Um, so just changing that perspective is pretty neat. 